Volunteering is giving, sharing, standing by others, supporting causes you care about, and creating a better future for everyone. This is why more and more entities support volunteering to achieve the sustainable development goals. Volunteers make a difference to the lives of many. Volunteer today for a better tomorrow. Good evening to all UN volunteers in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, good afternoon if you're in Africa, Middle East or in Europe. And to all of you in the Western Hemisphere, buenos dias and good morning. So we're going to start our special town hall with the UN volunteers globally on the 8th of March. And I'm Troy de Kurbanov, the Executive Coordinator of UNV. And of course, as you know, I'm joined by Kyoko Yokosuka, Deputy Executive Coordinator, who will help us with moderating the discussion uh, during this event. Uh, but we're here on the 8th of March for a reason, and not because 8th of March in 1979 is when the compact disc was first introduced to the public, and not even before Anne Bonny was born on that day. You know Anne Bonny? <laughs> Anne Bonny is uh, apparently the most ferocious female pirate of the Caribbean of the 18th century. She was also born on this day. Uh, but we're here today because today is International Women's Day. And it's okay, a UN okay. commemoration. Okay, uh, International Women's Day is a UN commemoration, which means that for us in the United Nations and globally, International Women's Day is not a holiday. It is, of course, a source and a moment of celebration. But even more importantly, it is a moment of reflection, recognition, and learning. And today we have a very special event with very special guests and speakers at today's panel, whom I will introduce shortly with Kyoko's permission before handing over to her. Your colleagues, you see uh, three speakers on the screen. So from, uh, from the top, um, we have Ulrika Modir, the Assistant Secretary General, Assistant Administrator of UNDP, and Director of the Bureau of External Relations and Advocacy of UNDP, and equally, if not more importantly, former United Nations volunteer. Uh, Ulrika is a living example of what it means to be once UNV, always UNV. She's still a very strong advocate and champion of UN volunteers. And colleagues, if you haven't seen her video, on Twitter, describing the role of the volunteers for the SDGs, I would recommend to look up. Also with us uh, on the screen today is another former UN volunteer and also a former Assistant Secretary General, Director of the Bureau of uh, Regional Bureau of Latin America and the Caribbean in UNDP, and uh, Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General in Colombia, our dear Jessica Fayetta. She is also once UNV and always UNV. Uh, her work across the UN system for a long, long time, and she has been a source of inspiration role model for many colleagues, and not only women, but also men colleagues in the UN, and one of them is speaking to you right now. And last but not least, we have our very dearest Flavia Pansieri, not a former UN volunteer, but that's okay. <laughs> she is the former executive coordinator of United Nations Volunteers. She was also the former Assistant Secretary General of the UN as De Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights. She played an important role as Deputy Executive Director of UNIFEM, uh, one of these institutions that late, uh, subsequently become, uh, became UN Women. Uh, but uh, Flavia is, uh, you know, as the saying goes, we stand on the shoulders of the giants before us. To me, Flavia is a giant, one of my predecessors, and a lot of work that we do in the UN, in UNV colleagues right now, where this focus on strengthening national capacity, national volunteers, women empowerment, all of this had had a major spurt under uh, Flavia's term in UNV, and we're building on her legacy. So with that short introduction, I'm looking forward to the discussion, and I'm handing over to Kyoko. Thank you very much, Tony. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It is really a pleasure and an honor for me to be facilitating this session today on the occasion of the International Women's Day with such a distinguished panel of speakers. So for today's discussion, first we have prepared three leading questions. And I will simply ask each of the panel members to respond to these questions. I wanted to give the heads up to the panelists that we will give you up to two minutes for each of the questions. In the second part, 
we have also questions from three UN volunteers. They have sent these questions through video messages, so we will play those and ask the panelists to respond to these questions. If the time allows, we may be able to take just a few questions from the audience, but we will see. So here goes the first question, and I will give the floor first to Ulrika and then Flavia and Jessica. And as I said, you have two minutes. Uh, the first question goes like this. What does it mean to be a women leader in today's world? Over to you, Ulrika. Thank you so much, and thank you for this opportunity. It's great to be in this company, and not least, of course, with all you and we uh, colleagues online. Well, I mean, I guess that question uh, has many, many answers, because at the end of the day, uh, we are individuals, we are women, but we also have multifaceted identities. And I think that this is also something that we need to understand in the world of today, uh, with increasing inequality, uh, with disinformation and misinformation being discussed also in the CSW these days, uh, how we really need to look at the complexity uh, of who we are, and then go back to the basics and the foundations of human rights. And that is the rights, but also the aspirations of each and every individual. Now, looking at gender equality, and I will be very brief, of course, there are reasons uh, to look closer into the still incredibly problematic situation with regards to women's rights, girls' rights, the inequality that hinder not only the aspiration or the fulfillment of the rights of girls and women, but actually our societies to thrive. Uh, and these gaps that we see, the hundreds of years that you and women colleagues have counted that it will take us until we actually fulfill the basic human rights that the UN was founded upon. I mean, it's simply not acceptable. And as we've seen, we are actually even moving in reversal. So heads up also for yet another special report from our Human Development Report Office, where we'll once again look at the gender bias, because even in parts of the world like the Nordics, where I come from, Sweden, we see actually a, a very strong pushback and an increase with regards to gender bias. So we have all reasons uh, to look at this and to be then, and perhaps this is my final note, uh, Kyoko and Toile, to be supportive to each other. And I hope that this is also what this town hall is all about, uh, because we have to see each other, uh, understand that each and every individual is very complex and beautiful as, uh this person is and and recognize the strengths of each and every one and exercise an inclusive leadership there is so much competition in this world also in the un uh, in these hierarchies of the un agencies uh, of our entities but those who exercise an inclusive leadership building on the strengths of others will be rewarded uh, because they will be recognized as good leaders that's my final note on this Excellent. Thank you so much, Ulrika. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Flavia, but I don't know if her um, connection is working. Maybe why don't I give the floor to you first, Jessica? Oh, Flavia, are you back? Will you be able to speak now? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, Flavia, you're muted. Uh -huh. mm. No, oh, okay, there you not, go. Not, yeah. perfect. It means itself. If we see that it's difficult, I would just close the mic because sometimes that's uh, making it easier. We are living in the countryside and the internet is a little bit iffy. Before addressing the question per se, I would like to give you a couple, a few, a few data. Uh, there is this group of retired senior UN women, uh, which has now expanded also to more broadly women leaders, who is called Global Women Leaders, Voices for Change and Inclusion, and I'm very happy to be part of that. And they've just published, coordinated by Maria Fernanda Espinosa, who's been a woman chairing the General Assembly in 2018-19, a report looking at how gender women's representation has been at 
APEC top levels of the UN. Secretary General, of course, never a woman, but also WHO, FAO, etc. Since 1945, there have been 382 leaders. Only 47 of them were women. That's 12%. And overall, women have been also in charge of the various organizations for 12% of the time. There are 13, one, three agencies of the UN who have never had a woman leader. Apart from IMF, the worst culprits, I would say, are the development banks. And there are five UN organizations who only elected a woman once. So this is really a rather despairing situation. On the positive is that currently a third of these organizations have a woman leader. So compared to 45, um, has been some improvement, but means is and leaders are few and far between at the top. It becomes therefore essentially important that we band together, that we speak with a common voice. This is what Global Women Leaders Group is also doing, because it's important to be uh, those of us who are in those positions, not just role models for the younger ones but mentors for them, supporting the younger generation that is approaching leadership position. And, in and also, and I would like to make this my last comment before I conclude, looking at my experience in Yemen, I was the first woman resident coordinator. I, generally, I was going to events. I was the only woman there. There were only men. Um, use not look at it, the situation of a woman as being a victim, but make use ruthlessly of the opportunity that it offers. In Yemen, I had a tremendous opportunity by dealing with all the men by virtue of the function and dealing with all the women by virtue of my gender. So I was knowing and interacting with both worlds in a context that was extremely segregated. So I think it's important that you want, if you want to really be an advocate for women, you look also at ways to reduce the separation, the segregation, and of course, always the discrimination that unfortunately is still very much there. And I hope that the internet has survived my words. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, it did. Thank you so much, Flavia. Now I give the floor to Jessica with the same question, please. Well, first, let me thank uh, Toilin and Kyoko for inviting me to, to be part of this uh, celebration, especially in the company of other inspiring women and, and former colleagues like Ulrika and Flavia. And let me also send a, a, a big um, salute and, and a commemoration also of the UN volunteers around the world, especially the women that are serving around the world. And in my own region in, in Latin America, where I have a, a wonderful team led by Lita Paparoni and a, and a great team. Um, look, um, being a, a leader, a woman leader in this time is, is a complex. I think it's as complex as, as, as it has always been. Uh, Michelle Bachelet was uh, has been quoted to say that politics, uh, when women enter politics, it changes a woman. But more important, when women enter politics, it changes politics. It changes the way politics and policies are made. And I think exactly the same applies to to, to women. And and women bring bring to to the leadership. Not they're not better than men. They're just different. They bring a different perspective. They bring. Uh, different skills, different abilities. It has been it has been um, well documented that women are more inclusive, are less belligerent, are more conciliatory, more compassionate, and think of the issues that affect women and affect family. So these are good things to bring to the table when it when it's uh, about leadership. But most importantly, I think that also because women think of family, think of, of children, think of their community. Sometimes when the going gets rough, women withdraw. And this is one of the things that we have to be 
uh, better at. And for that, the, in, my, in my opinion, the most important is for other women to support. For me, in my career, it has been not only I have I'm a product of inspiring bosses, women who have believed in me, but very important has been the support and the encouragement of other women, of peers who have showed us, who have accompanied us, who have encouraged, who have been our, our sounding boards and we have been for them. So this uh, the, uh, sharing uh, the leadership as we go along, as we grow in our leadership with other women is uh, it's very important. And, and of course, for us, when we are in those positions of leadership, to do the same for other women, to open their doors, to encourage them, to bet on them, to believe on them. And this is, I think, how uh, women... Uh, we need the first to we need the, to be the very first role models. We need to set our standards very high because we are measured by a very high standard. Um, but this is, I think, it makes us at the end better leaders and our contribution to 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 leadership in general, to going forward on the issues that uh, that uh, women care. So I think it's is is also a great opportunity. Yes, there are setbacks. And Enrica mentioned many of them, uh, especially in Latin America, I can see that. But I, I think at the same time, we know more, we are better prepared, and we just need to push through because we can be great leaders, and we are. Thank great. Thank you so much, three of you. I can see the common theme uh, of the women leaders, uh, the importance of women leaders really setting the examples at the same time, really supporting each other and also to encourage the future generations. So that's a very important message. I'd like to move on to the second question. And since the audience is majorities, are you and volunteers? Of course, we have to ask this question, which is how does volunteering experience strengthen leadership qualities? So I will start with now, I switch the orders now. I start with Flavia and then Jessica and Ulrika. So Flavia first, please. Thank you very much. Um, well, let me say this. Um, it is important in general, I would argue, but certainly in the context of UN work that we do not just look at competencies, obviously they are essential, but that we also look at values. What makes a person tick? What excites a person? What, what makes you wake up in the morning and say, oh God, I'm going to go and do what I really want to be doing. And that is inherent in the, the mandate of the UN, which to put it very, very simply is making the world a better place. And while I would argue that at the heart of this, there is a respect for everyone, working for equality. Uh, these are basic human rights. The very act of engaging on a voluntary basis is to me the proof that the individual shares the values that inspire the whole organization. In fact, I've been very often Making selections of candidates have to say, but many. And I always asked, wanted to ask the value question because that allows you to understand what is that triggers the engagement of an individual. And many time I would see in an application that someone had volunteered and it had not, not necessarily UNV in other contexts, in other various activities. This for me was an important indicator that this person was bringing not only the competencies, but also the values that we were after when selecting personnel for the UN. So the first thing that I would say is that volunteering is not only allowing a refinement and expansion of competencies because of the very nature of the responsibilities that go with, that go with the volunteer assignment, but also a way to demonstrate those values that we should always seek in anyone we associate 
with the work we oh, sorry the work you do because i keep forgetting that i'm not really in the un anymore but let me also say this you are right toily i've never been a volunteer myself when i applied for the position i was saying oh my god i've never volunteered enough yeah. as i was thinking i did realize that no there had been various moments in my life where i had done it prior to the un but now that i've left the un and i left the un but not the values of the un i find myself super busy volunteering so i think i think this is something that is is it should accompany us throughout our life because it is it's it's really a way of of how should i put it of being human beings at a point in time if we look around what's happening in the world today it's so discouraging that maintaining that level of humanity which amongst other things is demonstrated by the desire to engage without wanting to look at one's immediate uh benefit is is something that this world needs desperately today so great going strong you and v um i'm with you thank <laughs> thank you so much flavia um i give the floor to jessica please you know throughout my career i was uh, of course i started as a un volunteer but throughout my career i dealt with so many so many not only un volunteers but volunteers in general and i think that at, at the end of the day when i think what it did for me and what it does for other people i think it's certainly not only because being a volunteer brings us closer to 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 the people we are there to to serve to support uh, to understand better their their needs, I think this is a is a more of a relationship of of, of equals rather than a relationship of being um, either superior or something. So being volunteer because you're there exercising your 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 solidarity at the same time you're you're the same level. But I think being a volunteer also uh, helps us strengthen certain not only the values that that very uh, was very very well put by by flavia but also to grow as a person to grow to learn more it, it enables us to understand to be more compassionate to to grow stronger sometimes volunteers work in the in the worst possible uh, conditions in the worst possible situations uh see the worst of the people of of, of the world sometimes and being in that situation not only enables us to understand and to to really put ourselves in, in in the foot of people who in the feet of people who are suffering but also to 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 grow stronger because of that um but it also i think it's it's, it's a source of of ideas it's a source of of solutions sometimes volunteers work with very little means and they're able to come up with the most amazing um ideas and, and solutions with very little and, and, and also because of that, they are source of inspiration. Uh, so I think uh, volunteering is one of the most important actions that we can do throughout our lives. And uh, just like, like Flavia, I am also uh, very happy that I am now able to volunteer more. But certainly for those who do, and, and especially for UN volunteers, all my admiration, because I think I am a product of having been a volunteer. And I am always grateful and recognize and go back to that moment all the time. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, over to you, Rika. Thank you so much. And, and Flavia and Jessica, I, I very much enjoyed listening to you. And I agree uh, so much on uh, the need to look at what this does with regards to values. <clears throat> we have a decline, a sharp decline of trust across the world in our societies and once again please do look at our latest human development report and you will see some really concerning numbers across the world and what you do as a volunteer is of course being part of building that trust and not least of course you and volunteers being at the front line you know with the communities it's such an important important part of the UN's work to be present uh, with the communities out there. Also, as we will probably discuss in, in the most conflict-ridden settings, we are there, we stay and we deliver. 
Now, I would also agree um, that uh, this is also a great personal experience, uh, of course, um, because have we ever learned so much as we do when we are working with communities or when we work with a project together with others? It's incredibly rewarding in so many ways. And I would also, to Flavia's point, say when I look at uh, uh, recruitments, I also look uh, for these aspects. So many times when people ask me, I have the choice, my country can actually uh, send me as a junior professional officer to uh, uh, an office uh, in headquarters, or I can go and I can be closer to the communities through different activities of the UN. I would say, do not miss out of the opportunity to early in your days, but then as both Flavia and Jessica alluded to, throughout life, uh, also look for this because it is incredibly rewarding. It builds a lot of knowledge and experience, and it really speaks to the values that we have to continue uh, to build and rebuild in a world with declining trust in our communities between countries. Um, we have never seen, I think, uh, for many, many decades what we see in front of us now. So uh, not to manage expectations too much, but, but I do think that uh, UNV but also volunteers and, and I mean I'm, I'm I cherish very much I mean uh, the time I had in a local community in Guatemala just after the peace accord but I also cherish you know when I live here in New York now I for me this is a way to to get to know the community so I live in Brooklyn and I work in the local food co-op and I also engage in in the Prospect Park Alliance because for me this is so rewarding I get to know uh, people in a way that I would never have done if I only deal with this professionally. And then finally, I think also for us, as we represent, and maybe some of you will also uh, move in your career, maybe in the UN or elsewhere, we speak on behalf of people a lot. We speak today on International Women's Day on behalf of women. Who are we to do that if we actually only look at reports and if we don't look at the reality of people, if we are not there with people. So this is also something I'm cautioning myself and others, you know, who are we to speak on behalf of people if we are not looking continuously for that experience with people. So it's rewarding and I actually believe it's a good career path as well. Um, and it's very much needed to uh, continue to build the social contract that is uh, failing us in so many countries across the world. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for answering this second question. I think for many of the colleagues who are listening to this, it was really encouraging to hear from the senior leaders that you know the spirit of volunteerism and volunteering is very much aligned with the values of the UN and by volunteering these are further strengthened and it is a grow growth opportunity by volunteering and that it was also encouraging to hear that you know uh, it's not so much only about building the qualities to become the leaders but these leaders are also still volunteering so volunteering is a really a lifelong uh, aspiration so thank you very much for that the last question we wanted to ask you and this time we're going to ask jessica first and urika and flavia the last question is what can we do now to empower next generation of women leaders so over to you jessica please Look, I think uh, that one of the most important things that we can do to empower uh, the next generation is to bet on them, to bet on, on, on women. Um, I think that when I was, I, I remember the times when I have volunteered, I volunteered once to go and lead the reconstruction effort in Haiti after the, the, the earthquake, um, not knowing really what was behind, what was really expecting me and uh, one of the things that i learned from that and it's not from is that probably i was not there necessarily the most qualified i was not there the one that had the experience or the most senior but i i was there because i wanted to go and and to be frank a lot of people didn't want to go so going where nobody wants to go but it was my my bosses then kenan clark administrator uh, of UNDP and, uh, and Rebecca Greenspan, then Associate Administrator. Well, bet on me. 
and enabled me to 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 do this uh and and even though i was not the most qualified so i think that's a, a very very important thing to do is even though women may not be the 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 most qualified or the most experienced and many times they don't because they have not had that opportunity so that's a very first uh, very first step to to uh for other women to bet on women but also for men who are in leadership positions to 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 do that um and then for for women to encourage them to go and to take on challenges that probably uh, may seem to to be may seem to daunting push them to do that give them the opportunity but also encourage them because but also make it avail make it possible for them to do it in many ways women think of the women think of uh, of family have family needs and family aspirations and i think we should make that possible make that possible for women to have working environments where they can be both they can they can fulfill their family uh, aspirations but they also can fulfill their their career their growth their their professional growth aspirations i think this is one of the uh, one of the uh, important things and uh, uh, at the end of the day i also think that we need to bet on young people because one of the most uh, on young people and, and young women because a lot of the times you also go for the more experienced the older there's which we are right now but i at once at one point in my life i was the youngest the least the least experienced the the one who who was just growing just getting to know the, the and if somebody didn't bet on me didn't allow me as a young person to i would not have been i would not have grown so this is one of the three things that i would that i would say Excellent. Thank you so much, Jessica. Over to you, Ulrika, please. Thank you. Uh, and uh, also perhaps to go back to a comment we made earlier in the conversation. I mean, uh, in these days of time, it's easy to think that this is between uh, men and women. But, but really, how do we as women, you know, in whatever position we are, also recognize each other and support each other. I think that this is very important uh, to see. And this is why I continuously speak about the importance of inclusive leadership. I think those who are confident enough uh, to come out and see how to build strong teams around them, and you don't need to be a senior person, a manager uh, to do this. But I guess that this is what many of you who are on the call now in your daily work as volunteers have to do. You know, where do I find my alliances? Uh, those who show through best practice in a way that inclusive leadership and then being really mindful about looking at the talents, uh, not least of women in set, uh, settings where uh, we see um, um, a lack of, of gender equality, uh, will find that they build really strong uh, teams. Uh, so I, I, I also think we just have to acknowledge that it's not always the case that women are supportive to each other. Uh, I think all of us <laughs> can share examples where this has not happened. And hence, here's also where I believe that uh, today in this time, we also find a lot of uh, male colleagues who are champions uh, or however our colleagues identify themselves also in, in a more intersectional perspective. Uh, coming back to that uh, recognize, recognition of, of, uh, of uh, who we have uh, and the complexity, the complex nature of where we come from, uh, where, what we aspire for uh, and, and seeing each other. It's, and it's also, it goes back to once again what Flavia mentioned also in, in the uh, other question with regards to the values. I mean, it's really how we express our values. Uh, and I think we have to be very mindful in the UN about this because if we cannot set the example in our internal organization uh, it will be very difficult uh, to to teach and, and preach as we sometimes do vis-a-vis uh, -vis others so we really need but to set the example i think uh, though that the secretary general and, and we were speaking about the numbers also in turn, uh, before has uh, given a clear direction with regards to the need for the un uh, to move forward now we cannot any longer accept these numbers or 
this situation that we find ourselves in because how could we then be the global leader advocating as we do today and then these weeks also during CSW for the much needed change with regards to gender equality. Um, so be who you are, uh, trust in yourself, but also recognize others and be aware about the inequalities, not least gender equality and how we need to build strong teams, recognizing the talent of each and everyone. Uh, I think that's my best advice. Great, excellent. Thank you so much, Ulrika. Uh, finally, over to you, Flavia. Thank you. Um, before going to what we can do for the next generation, I would like make a, uh, to make a point for the next generation. Because what I have seen is in general, and I realize that the situations can be very different, but in, in, in societies that are a little bit more developed, if we talk about developing countries, women are very well aware of how long and difficult the battle still is. But if we look at, at societies, you know, the States, Europe, and so on, there seem to be in the younger generation the beginning, or rather, there is a beginning of a perception that the, bat, the battle is won. And this is not the case. If anything, there are areas where, which we considered in a key already settled that are being questioned again, just think what happened with the decision of the Supreme Court in the US on the right to, to choice and uh, the governments in many countries in Europe that are moving towards ever more repressive uh, regimes, frankly. So I think the first point for the next generation is to say, be on your toes. This is not a battle that has yet been won. We have to work at it and we have to work together. So what can we as more senior persons who have had um, the fortune, I would say, of having a career that has put us in position of relative authority and power, I think the first thing is, is to be to be acting as, as a role model, as a beacon, and be always ready to listen to anyone who is at the beginning of their career and, and empathize with the difficulties that they encounter because it certainly isn't easy. So I think that mentoring is something that we can, should, and in fact, I'm sure every one of us has done. I certainly have done it through my career, out my career to the point that I have now all over the world a certain number of, of sort of quasi waters that I I am still in contact with quite happily. And the more they get in trouble, the more they remind me of my own daughter. So um, it, it certainly is is. I hope both ways. Certainly for me, an extremely rewarding experience to be able to uh, mentor, support, and encourage a young woman who is making her first, or even not even her first, but further steps in environment that often are extremely inimical to women. Uh, mentoring is fine, but there has to be attention also to capacity development because too often, and I certainly fully agree with the point that Jessica was making before, we don't give women the opportunity to grow by making the experiences that would position them for the next step when the time comes. And it's something that I have discussed also and not perhaps at my most diplomatic, even with the Deputy Secretary General at one point, Eliasson, because there was the case, two cases that I can think of, possibly three, of women resident coordinators in countries that started being normal. And then there was a coup d'etat, war breaking out, and suddenly what happens? They are removed and they send someone who has crisis experience. Mm. You never get the right experience this way. The point mm. is not to remove them. And I'm sure that Jessica knows a few cases as well. The point is to give them the support that would be needed for them to continue in the position. And 
and very they find themselves uh, would provide uh, to issue a note of caution. I have also seen sometimes the best intentions in promoting women and encouraging having the counter effect. If you put someone in a stretch position that is too much of a stretch without mm. providing the necessary support, you set these women up for failure. And then you play into <clears> the <throat> hands of those who say, ah, of course, it's a woman, she can't do it. So there has to be a balance between <laughs> an, a careful analysis of a stretch, <clears throat> yes, but with support in order to build and strengthen the capacities, but also the self-assurance that is needed for certain positions. Mm -hmm. I think these are the things we can do. There is, of course, and this is, but I, I'm trying to open a door that is already wide open because I know UNV is very, very careful when it does selections for UNV positions to look at the geographic and as well as at the gender diversity that is desirable in all these conditions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, three of you. I think the key messages are coming nicely together. And as a manager, I think many of the things you said really resonated and I took lots of notes, but I think uh, basically to bet on women, uh, to bet on young people, encourage and push, but at the same time with necessary support so they can fulfill their functions and also to recognize and support each other. Those are really, really important um, messages. Thank you. So we would like to move to the second part of the Q&A. So as I mentioned, uh, we have asked our volunteers to ask you questions through video messages. So we will listen to the first message. And then um, this is from Silsila, who is based in Nairobi. And this one is addressed to Ulrika. So let's listen to the video message. Hello, everyone. My name is Silsila Rofe, and I'm currently working as communications officer with UNV East and Southern Africa Regional Office. It's a pleasure to be part of this town hall. And my question today is to Ms. Ulrika Mader and it is related to the current situation of Afghan women in Afghanistan. As we all know, Afghanistan today is the only country in the world where women are completely restricted to study, to work, or even have movements outside of their homes. And despite the recommitment by UN agencies and the international community and several visits and talks by the world leaders, these restrictions are still not being lifted and it's getting worse day by day for Afghan women. My question is, in your opinion, what can be done in a specific situation like this to help the Afghan woman? What different should be done this time for them to restore their access to education and restore their hope for a future? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Esilsila. So colleagues, Esilsila works as international UN volunteer and she is from Afghanistan. She is based in a regional office in Nairobi as communications and knowledge management officer. So the question was for you, Ulrika, over to you. Thank you so much and thank you, Esilsila. And I hope you are having a good time and I'm sure you can also contribute a lot to the work in Nairobi. I think, I mean, throughout the past, more than a year now um, and also before that uh, many of us have been incredibly concerned with regards to the situation of in in afghanistan and as you say we don't see the light in the end of the tunnel to start with i believe that the international community has to be very clear with regards to uh, as i said in the beginning basic human rights women's rights uh, and uh, as we know, I mean, the international community has also posed sanctions and there is not a recognition of uh, the Taliban government or regime in place. Uh, you were referring to uh, the many visits. I know that our UN uh, leads who have been uh, visiting the country uh, have been very clear in their conversations. Have things changed for the better? No, not necessarily. 
but what we believe, and I also alluded to this in the beginning, is that the strength of the UN is that we are there before, during and after the crisis, and we are there with the communities. And I use also to recall uh, the beginning of the charter, we the peoples. Yes, indeed, uh, in the UN we have representation of governments, but at the end of the day, the UN charter, the conventions, they are a promise to the people of the world, and they are indeed a promise to girls and women in Afghanistan and many other set settings uh, where just the basic human dignity and human rights are not recognized at the cost, of course, of the development of the society, of the country. But then I think, you know, being very clear on these norms and values and uh, also, of course, looking at how to use the sanction instruments as part of the international community is also doing, I still believe that we have to be there present as well uh, and that there are ways of localizing our support as we have done uh, supporting uh, women where they are because in the midst of all of this in different parts of the country uh, women entrepreneurs uh, those who lead micro small enterprises actually 35,000 of them in our network they are still waking up in the morning looking at how to make this possible how to uphold their economy, their family's economy, but also the local society economy. And through that, of course, the power uh, they can have and possibly also negotiate with regards to the right of them and their daughters. So what we have done in the UN is to see to that we can localize our support and hopefully uh, also support the agency of all these women that we find in Afghanistan across the country so that they can stay strong and be resilient and hopefully with this but also with the clear messaging uh, and the continuous pressure also from the international community times will change so i believe very much in supporting uh, the agency of people on the ground of course in this case women as much as we can and as, as an international community the resilience of them but then also, of course, to be very clear with regards to our standing as an international community and as the UN. Uh, I cannot promise that this will make change happen, but I think that these are the two key uh, uh, entry points for doing what we can do in this dark moment of time. And also, could I just also perhaps add, because I am sometimes concerned uh, when I listen to not least the traditional donor community saying, it's a lost case. We have lost 20 years of development in Afghanistan. And then uh, I used to think that they have not seen the strength of girls and women in Afghanistan, of the people in Afghanistan. They could never have experienced this if they say so, because throughout the past 20 years, a lot of capacity has been built, uh, a lot of strength, agency, knowledge, uh, of course, it's not lost. It's there with the people, but also, of course, with those uh, who live uh, abroad uh, nowadays as a consequence of this takeover. Uh, so we have to be supportive to these agents of change. Uh, we have not lost 20 years. Uh, all these investments in capacities in people are there and we have to continue to be supportive. So I think that's the strength of, of this. And we have to adapt, of course, and adjust along the way standing Great. strong with regards to the principles and the humanitarian principles as well. Thank you so much, Ulrika, for this intervention. I will now move to the second uh, question from the UN volunteer. So this time uh, it is from Ketevan, who is sending this message from Ukraine. And Jessica, this one is for you. So let's listen to the video. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be part of this conference. My name is Katrivan Kartidze and I'm UNV right now serving for IEM in Odessa. Being a part of UNV in Ukraine, I noticed that the majority part of humanitarian workers are women. However, when we are looking at decision-making sectors in the politics or higher levels in humanitarian organizations, we mostly see men. I would be very happy to see more women at the places where decisions about our future are made. So dear panelists, how you would empower and encourage those women who right now are doing incredible jobs at the, let's say, lower levels to be more brave and become part of decision-making sector too. Thank you a lot. 
Thank you so much, Ketevan. So, colleagues, Ketevan is a UN volunteer from Ukraine, serving as a national UN volunteer in Ukraine, serving as field assistant with um, IOM in Odessa. Jessica, you already talked about this, but if there's anything that you would like to add in terms of how we can encourage and empower women who are currently serving at junior level to be brave and become part of the decision-making sector. Over to you. Well, first, uh, Ketevan, my uh, solidarity and, and, and admiration for the people in in, uh, in Ukraine, and especially for for uh, women like you and your UNV colleagues who are working in, in very uh, difficult circumstances, um, especially as national UNVs. Um, my, my experience I have throughout my career, and not necessarily because I sought this, but basically because the situation happened that I. I found myself leading a number of times uh, humanitarian situations, some of them as, as daunting as the earthquake in, in, uh, in uh, Haiti, where over 200,000 people die, but also other natural disasters in the Caribbean and uh, in, uh, in uh, post conflict situations like, like Colombia. And some of you may know that after my retirement, recent retirement from the UN, I am teaching at, at Yale University and some of my, my students come to me and, uh, and ask me and they would like to work in, in uh, they would like to work in the UN or they would like to work in my, my um, advice and it's the same advice that I would give to the UN visas. Uh, you know, humanitarian settings are very complex. They're very difficult. Sometimes you say, you see very painful situations, but are at the same time is a privilege to be able to work in there, to work, to, to do something. Your work makes such a difference. So certainly uh, going to these situations, go where in, to, to work in this, uh, volunteer or just ask to, to, to go to places where people are suffering the most is to start a very important experience that should, we should all go, especially in the careers that we are looking, but in, in general, I think. Um, in, my, in, in my experience, in these settings, you need a lot of energies. These are 24 seven kind of jobs. I'm sure that, that you recognize this in, in Ukraine. Um, you, you have a, a lot of chaos, a lot of, and, and you need a lot of energy ideas. Um, and basically my, my experience has been that going to the, the young people, the young people who bring, these uh, these energies, ideas who don't care if there's not a place to live, who who are less wary about uh, the, sometimes the, the 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 perceived dangers, but these are the people where we get this energy to work in these different settings. And of course, when when, when we are young, this is uh, I, I remember that that's where I could go to 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 find. Um, finally, I think that uh, women, in, in in my experience are very uh, very conscious of what other women in those settings are needed, especially women. For instance, I remember in, in, in Haiti and in many, disa many disaster situations, there's a lot of construction involved in reconstruction, right? Construction work. And women are not necessarily skilled to do construction. This is a man, a, a, a man's job. And, uh, but if, if you don't include women, and this is something that came to me from the women, UNVs, who work in there. And of course, where you go to for this energy and passion is for the UNVs, hundreds of UNVs in, this, in these settings. And they alerted me that women are being left out of this, the only job opportunity that there is, which is basically to do reconstruction work or, or repairs of their own houses. And they are the ones who would like most than anybody repair their house. Mm -hmm. It is actually the women who realized it, that they're being left out if we don't include women in in uh, in disasters. And as you know, women are the most the ones that most suffer, more left behind in these in a conflict disaster situations. So I think we we definitely need that experience for for women, but also. Because women also bring these ideas, they are able to, to, to lead, they are able to understand the, the, the needs of, of, uh, 
of, of, of women, they are able to, to be more practical and uh, less conflictive, more inclusive of men also, um, they are also able to come up with important ideas and you need to uh, push your way to show that these ideas that you can, that these ideas, these solutions, these uh, are are feasible. And sometimes I think, of course, we need other women to to, to help that. But certainly to raise your hand, to 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 raise your voice, that you also have ideas is 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 very important uh, as a as a lesson uh, in my in my career. Um, and to, to persevere because I think right now, yes, there there may be more more uh, men in uh, in uh, crisis settings, but I think that women bring a lot of experience too. But you need to bring also your voice, your ideas, your energy, and uh, experience of just starting in those settings. So I I think that working in humanitarian settings, uh, agreeing to to go to these places. Uh, is the most uh, important experience that you can have to eventually have the, the have some authority to say, I can also lead in those settings. Um, I will leave it a, a, a like that and, um, and all my admiration for the work that uh, UNV is doing in Ukraine. Thank you so much, Jessica. Okay, the last video comes from Caroline, who's sending this message from Bolivia, and I would like to ask Flavia to respond to this question. So this is in Spanish, but it's with the subtitle. Let's listen to the video. Soy Caroline Oviedo, voluntaria ONU, asistente de programas y comunicación para la Oficina de Terreno de Voluntarios ONU en La Paz, Bolivia. Mi pregunta es, a lo largo de tu carrera profesional en el Sistema de las Naciones Unidas, ¿Quiénes fueron tus mujeres mentoras y qué cosas aprendiste de ellas? Great, so good to hear from you, Caroline. Caroline is a national UN volunteer from Bolivia serving as communications and advocacy officer. So Flavia, you already said that you are mentoring so many you know, colleagues, but maybe you can share your experience of your own mentor in the past. Uh, yes, I haven't been able to hear any of the three videos but if the, oh. the question was uh who mentored you uh which i think you conveyed to us let me say this um when i started my un career there weren't that many women around so it was a little bit difficult to find a woman who would mentor you and I would imagine that nowadays, uh, with what Me Too and all other woke and uh, political correctness, a man may be uh, a bit cautious when mentoring a woman. It's, it's important for young women, for uh, a senior woman leader to mentor them. But, you know, I think that a lot is what we can do ourselves in terms of looking at those um, of our bosses, peers, uh, partners that we know and see as being good leaders and learn from the way they address problems, engage colleagues, seek solutions and so while mentoring in one direction is certainly important it's also important to be proactive and try to um, find independently ways to enhance your skills by looking at is this person man or woman in the end it's it's not relevant uh, do I think this person is approaching the topic, the issue, the conflict, whatever, uh, in the right way to bring everyone in, to get the best from everyone's experience and so on? And in this way, you can also develop your leadership. I mm -hmm. certainly, if ever, I can consider a person who has mentored me this has been a university professor who was teaching Chinese history. I never sat for an exam with her, 
but she has been an inspiration for me in uh, both the uh, engagement with which she dealt with the issues that she was studying, the seriousness with which she was doing it, and at the same time without taking herself too seriously. Mm -hmm. So not playing the academic, uh, illustrious person, and being able to see also, and I think this is important, and it's important particularly in stressful context, being able to find the crazy angle, the funny aspects that helps you keep your morale up. Because I think it happened to me, but I think it must have happened to all of you at some point to say, oh my God, we are not making any difference. Things are going the wrong way. I'm giving it my best and there's no positive outcome. I know that when this happened to me, in particular when I was in Yemen and I had a number of those days, I would say, okay, shut up, do the processing work and don't, 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 the sun was shining, the sky was blue, and I would say, okay, let's leave and go back to work. Because if there is one uh, trait that I think is important in UN's work, and Ulrika and Jessica have highlighted the challenges in Afghanistan, in crisis countries, it is to be unrelentingly stubborn. It doesn't matter, it's difficult, we don't see progress, let's go on anyhow. And this, I think, is, is an important message that I'm sure all the volunteers in the difficult situations they mostly are in have already internalized without me having to tell them. They wouldn't be where they are if they hadn't realized that no matter how difficult, no matter how impossible the task is seems to be giving up is not the option and so we continue and we'll do it we give it our best and i am convinced and i agree with you that um, it's 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 dark right now in afghanistan in iran too for that matter with what i see in the the news about trying to prevent girls from going to school by by poisoning them it's 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 inconceivable but at the same time, I think leaving it, uh, giving up is not an option. And the UN is there not for the easy solutions, but to fight the impossible. So I would like to wish to all of you volunteers in the field to continue to be constantly and relentlessly stubborn in doing the good work you are doing. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Flavia. I think this is what's really a wonderful way to end this Q&A session. I think the message of unrelentlessly stubborn and not giving up, this is really powerful. So this concludes the questions and answers session. Unfortunately, I think we ran out of time, so we will not be taking questions from the audience. But I'd like to really thank the panelists, Flavia, Ulrika, and Jessica for sharing your personal journeys and insights and encouraging words. And happy International Women's Day from my side. And I hand over to Tori for the concluding remarks. Thank you, uh, Kyoko. I don't know how you managed to miraculously recap uh, every individual segment. Uh, I don't think I will ever be able to uh, give justice to this very rich discussion. You know, I would just say a few things. One, as uh, Ulrika at uh, I mentioned at the beginning, all of us have multiple identities. Uh, so I have multiple identities myself as well. One of them working in UNV now, but the other one is being father of two girls. So for me, this was very enriching experience. And what you have said, Ulrika, Jessica, Flavia, went straight into here and here. Uh, and I'm immensely grateful for you for sharing this wisdom uh, with me and other colleagues on, on the call uh, on this on this conference today. International Women's Day will be soon over, but as uh, Flavia said, the battle is not won far from, and we should continue to remain committed to this cause on the 9th of March, on the 10th of March, and on every day. And I think we can conclude this meeting saying that 
We will continue, we will remain committed to this cause, and we will remain unrelentingly, unrelentlessly stubborn, as Swabia said, while at the same time betting on each other, as uh, Jessica had also highlighted. That's all I have to say uh, in conclusion. Takso Miket to Ulrika. Uh, gra grazie mille to Flavia. Muchissimas gracias to Jessica. Arigato gozaimasu to Kyoko. And to all of you who have supported the conference behind the scenes and who joined, thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you so much, everyone. And do reach out to UNDP if you need. Thank <laughs> Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for. Volunteering is giving, sharing, standing by others, supporting causes you care about, and creating a better future for everyone. This is why more and more entities support volunteering to achieve the sustainable development goals. Volunteers make a difference to the lives of many. Volunteer today for a better tomorrow.